Good morning. Good morning. The Spirit of the Lord anointed Jesus to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God. A couple of announcements. Uh, we will have Bible study on Tuesday evening, uh, the parables of Jesus. We'll be continuing with the parable of the landowner and the workers in the vineyard. vineyard. Um, we will have our annual meeting on January 30th, but we're going to switch it to 4 o'clock instead of 3 o'clock. There were a couple of people who had issues at 3, so if you do it at 4 o'clock, I'll be sending out the Zoom link. Uh, any other announcements? Then let's turn in our bulletin to our responsive call to worship. <clears throat> Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from my willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us join in our hymn of praise, number 101, All People That I Know Do Well. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. If you're able, let us stand.
join in our unison prayer of invocation and confession printed in the bulletin. And let us pray together, saying, Spirit of the living God, we praise and adore you, for your glory shines throughout the heavens and the earth. As we worship you, open our ears to hear your truth. Open our eyes to see your goodness. Open our minds to know you and love you and serve you all our days. And open our hearts to experience your presence with us. As in the time of Ezra, we forget the mighty works of your hands that guide and sustain us. Forgive us, Lord. We confess, like the Israelites of old, we also forget our identity as your people, and so fail to give witness to your presence and power at work in our lives. Forgive us, O oh God. We confess that we fail to live as the body of Christ, made up of many parts, but given one spirit to drink. Forgive us, Lord. Anoint us anew with your spirit, so that we will hear and receive the words of Scripture proclaimed by Jesus and fulfill them in and through our worship, our witness, and our work in the world. Hear us now as we lift our personal confessions in silence. Touched by the power of the Holy Spirit in his baptism, Jesus brought good news of God's salvation through his death on the cross. <coughs> Rejoice, people of God, in Jesus the Christ, we receive God's forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Let us join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Brought the law before the assembly, 
which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them and as he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the priest, and the scri and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the word, words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the Lord, the joy of the Lord, is your strength. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church, the 12th chapter beginning at the 12th verse. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but <coughs> one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. And from the Gospel according to Luke. 
chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing and understanding of God's holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever run out of gasoline? It isn't an experience I would wish on anyone. I endured this experience, this misfortune, once as a passenger in a friend's car. All of a sudden, the car stopped responding. The engine quit humming, and the car sputtered and chugged to a halt. Anyone who has ever run out of gas, and thankfully, cars warn us now, you know how foolish you feel. We felt particularly foolish as school buses carrying our students passed us on the way to school. How does something like that happen? How do we let our tanks get so empty before we fill up? That day, as we chugged to a stop, fortunately not far from a gasoline station, my mother's words rang out in my mind. Don't ever let your gas gauge get below a half a tank. She used to say that all the time. Do you have a pattern to your Phillips? Maybe on Fridays, when the tank gets below half full, <laughs> most of the time, or a quarter full? Do you wait until your fuel light low light, fuel low light comes on? Or are you running on fumes before you stop to refill? The analogy of the fill-up certainly applies to our lives as Christians. Just as an automobile won't run without fuel, its source of power, neither do we. Only in the power of the Spirit do we truly reflect the light of Christ, the life of God within us? Those who attempt to go on without the power of the Spirit may find they're able to coast downhill for a bit and even roll up a short grade for a little bit. But soon, a time will come when the lack of fuel, the lack of God's power, will not permit further coasting. Then, life is stalled. Have you ever felt stalled? When we face illness, or the illness of someone we love, family turmoils, job difficulties, relationship strains, or the daily challenges of normal living, apart from the power of the Spirit, as our primary source of guidance and direction, then our tests, our temptations and struggles will stall us, sidetrack us in the same way a car runs out of gas. Fortunately for us, 
God provides all the power we need anytime we're willing to have it, to ask for it. And all we have to do is keep the channel of God's mercy unclogged from sin and turn toward the power that comes from God, God's grace, God's unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. Our gospel lesson began, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Where had Jesus been? We need to know that, lest we mistakenly believe that only when life is going smoothly do we gain the Spirit's power. Was Jesus returning from a vacation, an afternoon sojourn, a holiday visit to Jerusalem, perhaps? Having a day off? No. Jesus had just come from the wilderness, from the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. How do we grow in the power of the Spirit? First, through adversity. The power of the Spirit came on Jesus through the difficulties, the temptations he faced, the trials and problems he endured. And that's true for us as well. When Abraham Lincoln went off to the Black Hawk War in 1832, he was a captain. And through no fault of his own, he returned a private. Not sure how that happened. That brought an end to his military career. Then his little shop in the country village winked out, as he used to say marking his failure as a businessman. As a lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, he was too impractical, too unpolished, too temperamental to be a success. Lincoln turned to politics, but was defeated in his campaign for the legislature, the state legislature, defeated in his first attempt to be nominated for Congress, defeated in his application to be commissioner of the general land office, defeated in the senatorial election of 1854, defeated in his aspirations for the vice presidency in 1856, and defeated again in the senatorial election in 1858. But Lincoln pressed on, and in and 1861 found him in the White House as President of the United States. How did Lincoln interpret such a strange succession of failures and frustrations, which finally culminated in personal and political victory? He wrote these words, that the Almighty directly intervenes in human affairs is one of the plainest statements in the Bible. I have had so many evidences of God's direction, so many instances when I have been controlled by some other power than my own will, that I have no doubt that this power comes from above. How powerful do you feel today? Is adversity getting the best of you, or are you allowing that test, trial, or temptation to increase your faith and trust in God, providing you with an opportunity to grow in the power of the Spirit. Jesus returned from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. How do we grow? in the power of the Spirit, when, like Jesus, we allow our temptations, trials, and tests to build our faith and trust in God. Then, we will grow in the power of the Spirit. 
Where does Luke tell us Jesus went when he returned to Nazareth? Jesus taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Not everyone lived close enough to Jerusalem to attend the religious festivals and rituals and sacrifices there regularly. So synagogues developed in most communities, becoming the focal point of Jewish life for worship, instruction, and reflection upon God's activity in the world and in the life of Israel. How does worship change your day, your week, your outlook on life? I know I need worship in order to retain my perspective, recharge my batteries, refuel my cells, and rekindle the flame of the spirit in my soul. What about you? In worship, the power of the spirit is received, renewed, and rekindled in and among God's people. Turn of the 20th century Massachusetts physician, Richard Cabot, said, worship renews the spirit as sleep renews the body. As human beings, you and I need worship as much as we need sleep. President Calvin Coolidge said, it's only when we begin to worship that we begin to grow. How do we grow in the power of the Spirit? Second, through regular worship. To worship means to offer God honor and glory, the reverence, awe, and respect that God deserves. Setting aside one hour out of a week is not too much to ask. To worship means to praise and petition our Creator. We sing loudly, sit silently, and listen attentively as we surrender our wills to the will of God. We worship not because we come to church, but whenever we come before God in humility to renew our commitment to follow Jesus, who has called you and me into his service. Worship is our response to God's call. Jesus showed us that worship releases the power of the Spirit and more people worshiping together releases more of the power of the Spirit. Don't you feel it when there are more people here gathered together? The smiles on your faces tells me it's true. How do we grow in the power of the Spirit? Through worship. Our call to worship this morning, Psalm 19 says, talked a lot about the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. How do we grow in the power of the Spirit? Third, through reading, studying, and knowing God's Word, the Scriptures. When Jesus went to the synagogue to worship God, he stood up to read. 
He didn't read from just any book, some nice poem, or simple uh, wisdom from the world. He read from the scriptures. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the, for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God's power comes to us as we drink in the message of hope and love and peace that God offers to us through God's word. Scripture revives us right down to the deepest parts of our being. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, for the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Jesus said, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Isaac Watts, the great turn of the 18th century hymn writer, penned this verse. The stars that in their courses roll have much instruction given, but thy good word informs my soul how I may climb to heaven. Scripture, in a sense, is the extension cord connecting us to God's power because God's word is trustworthy and true and righteous. Scripture makes us wise in God's ways, fills our hearts with joy and our eyes with the light of Christ. When Jesus had completed the reading, he closed the scroll and sat down. It was customary for teachers to sit when they began to teach. Everyone was looking at Jesus, and he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In the scriptures, God made God's call on Jesus' life known to him and to others. And in the scriptures, God makes our call known as well. How do we grow in the power of the Spirit? By spending time in God's word. Reader's Digest had this story of a 747 halfway across the Atlantic when the captain got on the loudspeaker. Attention, passengers. We've lost one engine. But we can certainly reach London with the three left we have. Unfortunately, we'll arrive about an hour late. About an hour later, the captain made another announcement. Sorry to inform you, we've lost another engine. Still, we can travel on two. Don't worry, but I'm afraid we're going to be two hours late. A while later, the passengers heard the captain's voice again. You won't believe this, folks. We just lost our third engine. We can still fly with one engine. We will arrive in London three hours late. At this point, one passenger began, began to be very agitated. For Pete's sake, he shouted, if we lose any more engines, we're going to be up here all night. 
losing power is a very real problem in life unless we live in the power of the Spirit. When you feel powerless, remember, God uses our adversities, worship, and God's Word to build the power of the Spirit within us. For then, we will live and grow in the power of the Spirit. For that is God's resource for our lives. Amen. God has no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest belongs to God and the cattle on a thousand hills. As we continue in the spirit of worship, let us offer ourselves and our financial gifts to God, who created all things. The usher will receive the morning offering. justice and truth 
permeate all who serve in the justice system. May all who report or comment on the news reduce the inflammatory nature of their rhetoric, that understanding and cooperation might flow in our nation. When people disagree, reduce the temperature of their language so we might hear and understand one another. Protect the men and women serving this country here and overseas. Heal this nation of COVID-19. Most wonderful God, in Jesus, you sent us a brother who is one of us, yet also one with you. Inspire us with your spirit as we pray for our neighbors near and far, those in need. To the hungry and fearful, the homeless and cold, the jobless and isolated, because the future holds no sure provision, give hope, homes, and sustenance. To the depressed, the disheartened, and discontented, give new perspectives. To the insecure, the addicted, and abused, give your merciful healing. To the heartbroken, the sick, the sorrowing, the grieving, and the dying, give your comforting love. Most wonderful God, in Jesus, you sent us a brother who is one of us, yet also one with you. Inspire us with your spirit as we pray for your church. Allow the spirit of Christ to empower and enthuse the church throughout the world, and especially Grace Church. Draw all who claim the name of Jesus together, regardless of denominational differences. May the presence of Christ strengthen us in faith, hope, and love for all people. May your church reflect the living body of Christ as agents of freedom, healing, peace, and goodwill. Strengthen the faith and witness of all who call Grace Church their spiritual home. Most wonderful God, in Jesus, you sent us a brother who is one of us, yet also one with you. Inspire us with your spirit as we pray for our extended family of faith. May our young couples, individuals, and families praise you, our Lord, the great God, as they listen attentively to the book of the law and all the scriptures. May our couples know every day is sacred to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is their strength. May everyone here and those unable to be among us know that we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Joe, Betsy, Babs, Kim, Dominic, Gail, Carla, Joanne, Anna, Gary, Dave, Matthew, Kim's granddaughter Lydia, Gary N, <coughs> Sandy J, Muriel, Chris F, Chris M, Emma, Jean, Marion, Cliff, Caroline, Tina, Anthony, Todd G. so that there would be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Gail's brother John, Luella's family, DJ, Megan, granddaughter Caitlin, Karen's friend Faith and Dale, Karen Kay's father, Maurice, and 
daughter Kate, and son James, and Christy, and grandson Henry, Muriel's friend Eileen, her grandchildren Katie and Brian, daughter Jill, son Bob, and wife Kim, Karen's sons Joel, Scott, and Nia, Joanne's daughter Andrea and fiance Adam, son Thomas and Christy, and grandson, grandchildren Lucas, Oliver, and Eve, friends Gladys and Fernando, nephews Michael and Sean, sister Diane, our missionaries Adam and Janelle Bell, and their sons Jonathan and Thomas. May those we love, facing life-threatening illnesses, or grieving the loss of loved ones, remember that if one part of the body of Christ suffers, every part suffers with it. The Hill family, on Louise's passing in December. Luella and her family and her close, close cousin, Laurel's passing on New Year's Eve. Anna's friend, Christine, who's having treatment for bone cancer. David and the Trudell Smith Arborio family on Sarah, and Kelly, and Patty's mom, mom's passing. And the extended Davis went high family on Ellie's passing. Hear us now, Lord, as we lift the silent prayers we hold in our hearts to your throne of grace.
repaired by the restoring sacrifice of God the Son, Jesus the Christ our Savior, and refreshed by the rebuilding power of God the Holy Spirit, our companion and guide every day. Let us go forth to love and serve God as we love and serve one another. Amen.